SSD. And as these devices get smaller, as I said, we're shrinking them by a factor of 100 per decade in 3D volume and more powerful, multiplying their power by 1,000 every decade, uh, that's going to become more and more ubiquitous. We have an emailer who's asking from some career advice. He's an aircraft pilot, and he read your book, and he said that until reading your book, I assumed that I was in a good career, but I'm not so sure now. Am I in a dead-end job? Will our aircraft fly themselves? Can you discuss some of the impacts of the singularity on transportation? I, I think the way to approach careers is to not worry that much about whether particular types of jobs are going to become obsolete, but be open to learning and uh, keeping abreast of the world and, and following your passion. And if you're passionate about flying, I think by all means do it. I think the world will be a different place and uh, you know, most jobs that exist today will at least be significantly transformed in the years ahead. So this model where you go to school and then you learn a trade and that's your ticket to uh, employment and productivity for the rest of your life until you retire, I mean that model already doesn't exist uh, by and large. People really have to change what they're doing and I think people should have the attitude to keep learning and to follow your passion because it's not, you don't have to be, a, even though we're talking about a technological future, you don't have to be a technologist or an engineer to thrive because it's really knowledge and information that will have value but that includes music and art. And I mean look at how artists have been empowered. I mean artists used to you know, have a difficult time making a living unless they were very well known. But now there's this explosion of need for art and graphics on the web and artists are doing very well, particularly if they have computer skills. And same thing for music, musicians. And uh, so any kind of knowledge, if you have a passion for it, that's what you should pursue. Uh, and keep abreast of, of how uh, different, type, different professions change. I think ultimately transportation will become more automated. Uh, you know, certainly if you go out 15, 20 years, flying devices will be in fact personalized using nanotechnology and they'll fly themselves. But um, Flying devices, cars or, or something along that line as we, as we know it? Yeah, I think in 20 years we'll have nanotechnology based flying devices. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, hi. Uh, as more biological components are replaced by technological ones, and the rift between humanity and technology becomes more narrow. What do you think the possible effects will be on the human psyche, especially the way in which we define humanity and differentiate between it and technology? Well, I, th I think it's going to change. And you can see already, you know, s movements like body modification, uh, tattoos and piercings and so on, which uh, go back, I don't know, 15 years, there was a pretty mi fringe phenomenon, is now very mainstream. Uh, and people walk around with devices on their eyeglasses and in their ears. And uh, even five years ago, if you had a little microphone in your ear with an antenna, that would seem pretty weird. Now we routinely accept that. So conventions actually change pretty quickly, particularly when technologies become viable. Uh, and we, we adjust quite rapidly. I mean, just look at how rapidly we've become wired and online. You w walk around a college campus and everybody is online with their computers and their things in their hands and in their ears and they're in some virtual environment while they're walking across campus. And uh, that, that didn't look like that even five years ago. Uh, so as these technologies become perfected, I think we, we accept them more and more. And I think we will accept the idea of enhancing human ability with our technology because it's a slippery slope from just correcting uh, problems that occur from disease or disability uh, to actually being able to go beyond, quote, normal. And one reason it's a slippery slope is there's no such thing as normal. Uh, human, be human beings have a, a broad range of abilities. But really, it's the thrust of technology in general. It's why we started creating tools was to extend our reach. And we started out with the Industrial Revolution extending our physical reach, and we've already you know, have a half century of extending our mental reach. And our, our ability to do that is going to become more and more powerful as these tools become more intelligent. Lansing, Michigan. Afternoon. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to talk to you, sir. Um, I, I do a one-man show about Thomas Jefferson that I take to school. And in my research, I came across a quote that um, 
our third president uh, supports you, and I wondered if I could indulge you for a second to read that to you. Be interested. Uh, The quote goes like this. I am not an advocate for frequent changes in laws and constitutions, but laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As they become more developed, more enlightened, and as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, and uh, manners and opinions change, with a change of circumstance, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the time. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that. I think I will actually use that in a future book. Um, and actually, if we can get your name, uh, I'll cite you in a footnote. Um, that's a very modern quote that could have been said today. And it's interesting that the, the pace of change and technical progress was noticed back then. Most people did not notice it. <coughs> I mean, 200 years ago, people's grandparents, by and large, lived the same lives they did, and they expected their grandchildren to do the same. It was perhaps 200 years ago that we just started, or at least thoughtful, prescient people like Thomas Jefferson noticed that things were changing and that there was such a thing as progress. Because uh, you go back hundreds of years, the idea of progress, people never heard of it. They just thought things stayed the same. Uh, there was progress, but it was at such a slow pace that it was not noticeable. Now you'd have to be you know, pretty asleep not to notice the rapid pace of change. But that's a very up-to-date quote. I appreciate it. Is there any form of a modern-day Luddite still in the world? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's very strong Luddite movements. Uh, I mean, take the anti-GMO movement, genetically modified organism. Now, I'm not saying that GMOs are inherently safe. I think they need to be tested like any other new food or, uh, or you know, invention that affects our biosphere. But there's been just a reflexive anti-GMO uh, movement that if something is genetically modified, it's absolutely wrong, uh, which I think is just an inherently anti-technology stance. Uh, Golden rice, it's now been approved, but it was held up for five or six years. It could have saved hundreds of thousands of kids from going blind in Africa uh, because of a genetic modification that would uh, provide uh, the right vitamins for these kids in, the, in their foods to stave off uh, this type of blindness. Uh, African countries have been lobbied not to accept certain uh, grains, uh, certain seeds that would overcome the natural blights that wipe out their uh, their livelihood. Um, that's changing now, but uh, that, that was an example of, I think, a reflexive anti-technology movement. And there, there is a, a strong anti-technology movement. Uh, Bill McKibben, who, who I respect, has actually brought global warming to our attention, wrote a book called Enough, where he says we have enough technology, at least enough advanced technology. Now, his, his position is actually more sophisticated he says certain types of advancements we should continue, and it's a complex discussion as, as to exactly what we should do and what we shouldn't do. But it's an example of an opposition to a certain type of uh, advancement that we shouldn't, for example, ex radically extend human longevity, which I think we've been in the process of doing for a thousand years, but now we're getting to a point where we can do it much more rapidly. But there's definitely strong anti-technology movements uh, particularly in some academic circles. Los Angeles, California. Hi. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm extremely impressed and uh, have not had much exposure to you aside from your phenomenal keyboards and <laughs> music programs. I'm actually a nutritionist myself and also am extremely impressed with your knowledge of, of my field. <laughs> and uh, I actually have a question more about uh, the implications of uh, nanobes in the uh, human brain and the uh, basically tendency of governments, especially democracies, to lean towards and eventually turn into what becomes um, almost a monarchy and the uh, likelihood of nanos being used to control the populace and how we would avoid that in the future. Well, you know, when we have software running in our bodies and brains, all kinds of issues that we now actually struggle with already, even though most of the computers are not yet inside our bodies and brains, will become even more important. Uh, privacy. Well, we already do very private things in, in our computers, and uh, 
and we realized that people can easily put a spy program on our computer and report back to somebody we don't know everything they were doing. So this is already a, a concern. Uh, software viruses and other type of malware is an issue given all the important things we do on our personal computers. But when those computers are inside our bodies and brains, uh, that's going to be more of an issue. We're concerned about security and privacy of health data. Well, if we've got all these computers with that health data inside our bodies and brains and people hack into it, put spyware there, that's going to be a big concern. And potentially, people could send software viruses into the, into the nanobots inside our brain and actually influence our thoughts. I mean, that, that potential is there. That's one of the downsides of these technologies. Uh, software security, therefore, becomes more and more important an issue. Uh, technical issues like encryption, which get very technical, but are actually pretty fundamental, I think, to the future of humanity. Being able to maintain privacy is, is, is very important. Uh, and actually, a lot of advance has been made in encryption. Uh, encryption actually tends to stay ahead of the decryption technology to the dismay of intelligence agencies, but to uh, the delight of, of privacy, people are concerned about privacy. So yes, this will be an issue. Uh, I think you know overall we get a lot more benefit from our personal computers and the internet today than uh, we are harmed by this kind of malware and software viruses. And we actually have a pretty good system for protecting ourselves from software viruses that we've invested in. Uh, new software virus is discovered and it's reverse engineered, and a protection is created and distributed virally to the internet, generally within 24 hours. So we've done a pretty good job of actually defending ourselves from software viruses. We actually should learn from that as to how we should deal with biological viruses. But this is a whole area that actually will be get more and more concerned as the technology gets more and more intimate. And it's already pretty intimate. As far as the advances are concerned, is it the United States that's leading those advances, or are there other countries involved? I think we're already very close to a worldwide uh, system, a worldwide economy. Uh, you know, you buy a product and, you know, might have software done in Silicon Valley and uh, certain mathematical problems were solved in India and it was constructed in China and with just-in-time inventory systems designed in New York. I mean, it, we, typical products which have sophisticated software and hardware are already quite complex and involve people all over the world. And uh, most products uh, are intellectual and that the intellectual Part of products, like product designs, can just circulate the globe in, in seconds on the internet. Uh, and this has actually empowered China and India to become successful. But I don't see, uh, it's not a global race as if there's a fixed size pie, and if China and India get more, we're going to get a smaller slice. It's really a positive sum game. The Chinese engineer is creating value for his or her company, but also for us, because we all benefit from all of these products. And this is actually leading, to, in my opinion, to, to, uh, to the economic growth we see. The information, y you might expect that the information technology sector would shrink because it's 50% deflation factor. And some economists actually are worried about that. But if you can get the same stuff for half the money a year later, that the size of the economy as it has to do with information would shrink. But we actually see that this, the opposite is the case. We more than double our consumption. When price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode on the landscape. And we have had 18% growth in information technology in every area in constant dollars for the last 50 years, despite the fact that we have a 50% deflation rate. And in fact, that is what is driving economic growth. There's more and more of the economy is comprised of this information technology, which is growing 18% a year, and less of it is comprised of these non-information industries, which are shrinking. Uh, the, the growth rates are increasing, and we see that with these fantastic growth rates in China and India, and even Sub-Saharan Africa, because of technology, had a 5% growth rate last year. About eight more minutes with our guest, Miami, Florida.